Dr. Wolf here. Uh, we're going to do some training on the, the Pinacam AXL Wave. And Susie, one of my staff members, she's going to be our, um, our guinea pig today. We have drops over here that we use for various things. Sometimes we need to dilate to get a uh, better cataract uh, evaluation. Lubricant drops sometimes when we hold the eyelids really wide open for uh, corneal maps or scleral maps. Um, everything's kind of set up over here. What we're going to do is just essentially clean the instrument first, kind of wipe it down with alcohol. You don't typically need to review this, but it's an important, important step you don't want to forget. At the same time, kind of looking at the table for any like eyelashes and any kind of stuff that is hard to see from the other side of the table. Kind of wipe that down. Susie's been in the instrument before, so I didn't have to add her, so, but I did find her through the feature here, and then you can go to this button that says Pentacam. Pentacam is kind of like opening up um, the acquisition uh, component to the instrument, uh, as well as the review. So at the top, you'll see patient examination, display settings, okay? You're basically going to go to examination, and then you can do a scan, but because this is the Pinnacam AXL Wave, the AXL Wave is, is a multi-modality instrument, so it's gonna have a lot of different features. So what we're gonna use is, is a sequence. A sequence is going to walk us through each of those, each of those different modalities. So this loads up the acquisition um, display here. And then the different things that it will do is aberometry, which will give us a prescription as well. Retro, retro illumination through the pupil and any uh, media, cornea or lens. And then axial length, you'll see that it's basically, most people are going to be in the top one, phacic. There is, you know, rarely aphacic patients, but you they, they are out there and you do need to just confirm before taking these scans so that the uh, instrument can calibrate appropriately. Pseudophakia is going to be our patients that have already had their cataract surgery with with um, with implant, um, the type of um, IOL um, most commonly is going to be the acrylate IOL, but uh, I don't know if it matters that much. I guess I have to look into that. Um, oil filled after vitrectomy. Again, this is not very common, but there are patients that have had uh, retinal detachments and they've had vitrectomies and they've they've had maybe like a serious um, open globe injury or a uh, car accident or something like that that's basically forcing them to have essentially a retinal detachment, vitrectomy, uh, oil uh, within their eye, and cataract surgery all, to, uh, all together. So this is a pretty complicated case, but the instrument needs to know basically what the index of refraction is between the different parts of the eye, whether it's essentially more like water, more like oil, and that will change how it calculates uh, the length of the eye, okay? And then tomography is essentially going to be mapping out the cornea, but also including the anterior chamber, lens, iris. So we're going to start at the front and it just kind of works our way systematically through. You do want the lights off. So we're going to turn the lights off in the room. We also do have a black curtain over to our right. Um, you can have some amount of ambient light in the room, but what you need to know is the front side of this instrument is um, facing the patient. Um, it has a, uh, a rotating camera. So the way this instrument works is there's essentially two cameras. There's a static camera that just stays where it's at, and then there's a rotating camera, okay? And so you need to be mindful of any reflection that may be coming at the instrument. That is probably okay over here, but again, if you had like a computer in the background who's maybe monitors facing, that will give you uh, erroneous data. So we've already taken care of that, so we're gonna get started over here on the right eye. Susie, you rest your chin there. Like all instruments, you can just raise and lower the table. You feel pretty good there? Mm -hmm. It's an infrared, infrared camera. On this particular one, you're going to see four dots with a blue circle. And ultimately what you want is you want a blue line on all four sides of the circle. And that's gonna tell you when you're in focus. So you, and as you push in, you'll notice that the, uh, 
the white circles become a little bit sharper. So it's a little bit blurrier, a little bit fuzzy, and then it becomes a little bit sharper as you push in. What they are seeing is displayed on the right side of the screen where it actually says patient view. So they're seeing a hot air balloon. This part I believe is important. You need to verbalize to the patient that the hot air balloon will be blurry at times. It'll be in focus and then it'll go out of focus and then it'll do that typically multiple times. It's important to let them know that they can let it be blurry if you want to get an accurate refraction. So this is similar to like a, a, a typical like auto refractor where if the patient is trying to keep the hot air balloon in focus, then it's gonna give you a significant over minus. So Susie, you'll see the hot air balloon, just try to keep it as, um, just let it do its thing. It'll be blurry and clear. You'll see that the instrument will also tell you if you need to push in or pull back out. It's very sensitive though, so it's very small movements, but you'll see where it's got the four blue bars or four blue lines around the blue circle. That's what allows the instrument to capture when you have all four of those. Once it does so, it's gonna give you your Shack Hartman aberrometry, which is basically all these little dots are from the lenslets within the Shack Hartman aberrometry. It will process that, and then it'll give you an aber, aber uh, wavefront map, a higher order wavefront map. Now in this display, ultimately she doesn't have really hardly any aberrations, so it's gonna be essentially one color, but people that have higher aberrations will get more variety in color. Prescription is listed here, so it'll give you a spherical equivalent, okay, which is really nice, especially from a, uh, a general contact lens you know, standpoint, or maybe you're gonna use this to put into a, uh, a visual field instrument. And then also it'll give you the more precise uh, spherical cylinder and axis. So all that looks good. Now, at the same time that it did the aberrometry, it also took the retroillumination. So you don't have to necessarily do that twice. It'll do both of those tests at the same time. You do wanna check retroillumination and verify that you have a nice image. If you didn't have a nice image or, or if you had a blink, you can repeat only this portion without repeating aberrometry, okay? Now in hers, it came out great. Again, it's gonna give you basically your angle kappa uh, information and then it's going to give you a, the size of the pupil which is basically going to be a scotopic, uh, scotopic pupil. Okay, Susie is fake still, like most of our patients. And then this will be similar. So at this point their patient views change and they're going to see a red dot, okay, kind of a flashing red light. That's the fixation. So you just focus on the red light Otherwise, it's much the same. You're gonna have a blue circle and you want the little white dots to get small and in focus. And then when this little crosshair in the middle is also in line with the circle that's flashing, then it's gonna capture six um, uh, ultrasounds, six A-scan ultrasounds or optical biometry ultrasounds. So once this, try to keep the cross right on that central one and then it's going to do in consecutive order six ultrasounds. Once it does that, it processes the information and it's going to average out your axial length measurements, which is the, the length of the eye from front to back. Okay, and you can see that information right here. SNR is basically your, your signal strength that's uh, like the quality of your, your data and the, the higher the number, the, the better the quality. There are gonna be some eyes, particularly like, you know, eyes with uh, cataracts, eyes with keratoconus, uh, scar tissue, you're not gonna get a good signal strength, uh, but that's okay. You can tell what the quality is by the grouping of the scans. If the grouping is nice and tight, then you still have a reliable, reliable data despite your signal strength not being very good, okay? Obviously, Susie has very normal, healthy eyes. So all her results are looking great. So now this is the tomography. Tomography is going to be mapping out the cornea, but again, it also will map out the uh, um, anterior chamber. Like the other scans, you're gonna to try to get the white dots to be as in sharpened and focused with the blue around it, and then the uh, blue crosshairs, you're gonna get right in front of that, that central dot. Um, the fixation is essentially the same. You've got that flashing 
um, red line. Now, if you'll notice in the bottom left of the screen, you can actually see the eye down here, and then you'll see that red light or that red dot. When the red dot and the red line touch, that's when the instrument will start capturing. And it's not a single uh, picture, it's going to be about a two second scan. So this is the one that uses the rotating camera and that camera will rotate around 360 degrees. So it's important when you start to get really close where the eye and the line are coming together, you instruct the patient to blink a couple times and then open their eyes wide and then tell them to hold their eye open until they see that that blue bar has stopped rotating. So Susie, we're gonna go and do that. You can blink a couple times, open real wide. And then once it starts to rotate, keep your eyes open wide until it stops rotating. Okay, good. And then this is our corneal tomography scan. So it's gonna take 25 in this particular situation, you can set your settings to where you can actually view 50, um, 50 rotating images. So we'll give you your information here. You can see basically a infrared image of the eye. Uh, you can also look at the blood vessels and you can do this on the aberrometry view as well. And this is a really nice way of essentially seeing how uh, red or irritated, Susie, you can sit back if you want, how red or irritated or inflamed the eye might be. The AR image here is gonna get, get you a pupil size. This is gonna be more of a photopic pupil. So it's a little bit smaller than it was on the previous image. Um, as far as eyelid position, you can have them uh, hold it open. You can, you can help yourself. You can have the patient try to pull their eyelid further apart. Uh, you might be able to use a speculum or sometimes it requires just, just two people. For Susie, hers came out looking great. And then in the middle, you have essentially uh, two scans that are 90 degrees apart from each other. The blue bar represents the camera, where the camera angle is, where the scan is. And so as you scroll around, you'll see your images will rotate, and the top and bottom images are always just 90 degrees apart, okay? To the right is gonna be your maps. It's not all of your maps. If you wanna review all of your different maps, uh, you would go to display settings, and there's a, a variety of display options you can look at in more detail, but it will give you some of your main ones, your corneal thickness map, okay? Your tangential curvature map, your axial curvature map. These are some of your, your most, most common ones, okay? There's also a, another feature in tomography that's called CSP Pro. CSP stands for corneoscleral prophylometry. And then some models of Pinacam will just have CSP, which is going to be five images taken separately, a central uh, top, bottom, side, and side. So five positions of gaze, and then the software will stitch it together. And this particular model, it takes a single shot. So that's the CSP Pro model. It will just take a single capture 18 millimeter image. Um, we are not gonna do that one right now, but we, we can, circle back to that unless, unless you want to. <laughs> but ultimately, if you just rest your chin in there, you hit new scan. Otherwise, it's going to look the same. The only difference, and um, the difference on this one versus before is you see there's now an additional blue line to the side. Everything in the middle looks exactly the same. Even over here, it looks the same. Or fixation is the same, but what's different is this blue 15 millimeter zone. And ultimately what you try, want to try to do is get the eyelid outside of that, whether that's with an additional person or with a eyelid speculum, okay? And if you're going to do something like that, then it's advised that we use um, some anesthetic eye drops, okay? We're not gonna take this one for you right now. Okay, let's go ahead and just finish up going through this with the left eye. So if you just move the instrument from the left side to the right side, the instrument already knows which eye that you're on. So we're on the left eye now. Okay. And it will automatically go back to the aberrometry and make you, it won't make you, but it'll start at the top and go down. But if you wanted to skip that, you can always just select 
a different function here. So we'll go in order with the left eye. Susie, let the hot air balloon come in and out of focus. This is the most sensitive of the tests. Okay, good. Just like before, it'll give us our pupil size in the dark, scotopic pupil. You can also look at the blood vessels in any of these views. Okay, you can look at the quality of your Shack Hartman aberrometry. Again, Susie has very minimal aberrations, very minimal prescription as well. We'll check our retroillumination, which came out looking very good. Axle length, we'll select phacic. And then Susie, look at the flashing red light. Just be as still as you can. And then once the crosshairs meet that central dot and then the bars are all around that circle, it'll automatically capture. We'll average that. Again, we have a nice signal strength. You know, again, Susie's is very normal eyeball length. And then our grouping is very close together. Each of the colors represents one of the six scans. Tomography. Mapping of the front half of the eye. Same thing, look at your red flashing light. Try to keep the crosshairs close, blink, blink, blink. Open your eyes as wide as you can. And then... Keep your eyes open until it stops rotating. Very good. And you can sit back. And then again, we can kind of briefly see these images as it's processing, you'll see the spinning bar loading. Okay, great. So quality, we're getting a good amount of area scan. We can go through, make sure that we don't have any reflections off the camera from any light within the room. Uh, we can also check to see if there's any movement. The instrument will automatically detect things like movement. It'll detect if the fixation is off and then your quality score will indicate that and it'll say, you know, alignment, misalignment. It'll, uh, it'll say blinking error. It, it'll tell you basically what went wrong. And then if it says okay, then it's a good usable scan, at least as far as those metrics go. But you may decide that although the quality score is okay, maybe you want to get the eyelid further out of the way. Okay, so it's sometimes you might want to repeat it. And if you ever want to repeat it, get an additional scan, you would hit new scan and then go through that process again, okay.